It's my pleasure to introduce our new speaker, uh, Dennis McKenna. His title of his talk is Beyond Ayahuasca, Occurrence and Biological Activities of Some Naturally Occurring beta carbolins uh, So Dennis has a very extensive CV that I think most of you are familiar with. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too many details, just say that he has been around for more than th three decades and is a great reference to the majority of us. He's an ethnobotanist, he has a PhD, and he is currently assistant professor in the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. Please welcome Dennis McKenna. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. Good afternoon. Could we get the first slide up, the beginning? Actually, it's the one before that. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, this is uh, I would, the last uh, ayahuasca, or the last uh, psychedelic science conference I was at was in 2013. It seems to have grown a great deal. And it's evolving. It's rather amazing to see all these people here, and it's wonderful to be invited and, and meet uh, so many old friends and new friends, so that's fantastic. Big shout out to Rick and Bia and all the other people that have been involved, many people. Um, well, I guess, I guess one of the things that uh, ayahuasca is supposed to teach you is humility. And uh, sometimes you need a slap upside the head to learn that. I just got it as, I, uh, as my water bottle exploded in front of me. So fortunately, you can't see, <laughs> but I look like I, uh, I did a bad thing in my, it, you know. So, you know, there it is, humility, right? Uh, yeah, remind you that, uh, you know. So anyway, uh, I'm glad I have the podium here. It's, 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 it's not a pretty sight. So, uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about chemistry a bit and pharmacology. It won't be like these previous, uh, um, talks. It will be rather dry, and but hopefully not boring. Um, and uh, it will be kind of reductionist, but the, uh, uh, the title of the talk is Beyond Ayahuasca, Occurrence and Biological Activities of Some Natural Beta Carbolines. And, you know, when we speak of ayahuasca, uh, we know that it is a combination of uh, beta-carbolines and DMT that's responsible for the activity, beta-carbolines being monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Behave yourself now, please. Uh, <laughs> and dimethyltryptamine, which is not orally active because it's broken down by monoamine oxidase in the, in the gut. And the beta-carboline alkaloids, uh, are potent selective monoamine oxidase A inhibitors. So you all know this. They protect DMT in the gut. They allow it to be absorbed through the, into the bloodstream. And so that's what renders ayahuasca orally active. DMT by itself is, is, uh, is not orally active. And there are three main alkaloids. I don't know if this is uh, working. It doesn't. Oh yeah, here it is. You just so there are three main alkaloids, and they represent essentially a series of uh, of uh, uh, aromaticity. The most aromatic being harmine, and the least being tetrahydroharmine. But those are the three primary uh, alkaloids in ayahuasca, and. Uh, that's how we have tended to think about beta-carbolines all this time. They are activators of dimethyltryptamine and they're not psychoactive themselves and they're not really interesting beyond that. Turns out that's not the case. They have some very interesting properties on their own and I think beta-carboline chemistry and pharmacology may be a new frontier, a so far neglected frontier, that is gonna attract a lot more attention. For example, Tetrahydroharmine, it turns out, one of the major components of ayahuasca, it has the properties of an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, as well as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And, that, and it also has the longest half-life. So that gives us some interesting properties. One of the 
result, oops, oops, oops. <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> okay, uh, got to push the correct button. One of the results of our study with the UDV in 1993 that was, that was unexpected was uh, apparently tetrahydrohormine upregulates the serotonin transporters. In long-term users of ayahuasca, they have a significantly elevated level of serotonin transporters. Those are the proteins on which SSRIs work. And ayahuasca tetrahydrohormine specifically upregulates those transporters. When we made this discovery, we didn't really know what that might mean, but we thought it was interesting because it was a, it was a biochemical marker that set long-term users of ayahuasca from apart from people that were not drinkers. We had a uh, aged and sex and uh, socioeconomically matched sample. So we didn't really know what it meant at the time. But we uh, delved into the literature and it turns out that uh, there's quite a literature on uh, pathologies related to deficits in these serotonin transporters. Uh, certain kinds of alcoholism, uh, early onset alcoholism, and uh, I can't really see that that well, a violent uh, homicidal behavior, suicidal tendencies, and binge eating. All of this has been lo uh, linked to a deficit in the serotonin transporters. And interestingly enough, the fact that ayahuasca kind of reverses this may be part of its therapeutic uh, efficacy. It may actually, it, you know, the pathologies that were showing up in our UDV study were exactly this kind of thing. And ayahuasca had been useful for the members as long as they kept drinking it because this is not a permanent effect. It lasts about two weeks. The effect is, uh, and uh, so this may be a key to some of the therapeutic activities of ayahuasca. Not so much the, the intense psychedelic experience, but the longer term effects of tetrahydroharmine. Okay, so we could kind of leave that behind uh, for the moment and, uh, wait a minute. No, okay, I, yeah, we could leave that behind because this is supposed to be about beyond ayahuasca, right? So. Uh, Beta-carbolines, like tryptamines, are quite widespread in nature. They're not uncommon at all. And they represent an incredible uh, range of, uh, of structural diversity, as you can see here. And great complexity. Some of these are uh, quite complex molecules. So here, you know, for natural products people, this is a gold mine because the beta-carboline nucleus represents a scaffold on which you can build. And uh, as you do so, you modify the pharmacology, just as you can do with tryptamines or phenethylamines and so on. So here's a whole unexplored area of uh, natural products, chemistry, and pharmacology represented by this uh, incredible uh, molecular diversity uh, of uh, beta-carboline derivatives. Interestingly, some beta-carbolines, the simpler ones, happen to be photo dynamic or phototoxic. This is a, uh, the, the publication page of uh, the first peer-reviewed article I ever got published anywhere in 1981, I think, in phytochemistry. Totally accidental discovery that when you took beta-carbolines, exposed them to UV light, if you expose bacteria that were, had beta-carbolines in the, in the Petri dish, uh, in UV light, it would kill those organisms. And if you did the same experiment in the dark, you got no effect. Interestingly, if you uh, exposed uh, eukaryotes, such as yeast, to this same treatment, it was totally insensitive to it. But bacteria uh, showed this, uh, this photo, phototoxic uh, effect. Uh, a very simple experiment to do, and we could actually do some very nice structure activity uh, relationships. And turns out the the fully aromatic beta carbolines were uh, more active. The tetrahydros were not active at all, and the, and the dihydros were somewhere in between. So interesting finding, and others have built on this. 
uh, and we know now that uh, beta carbolines can form photoadducts with DNA in the presence of uh, UV light. So that's an area worth uh, looking at uh, further. And uh, so let's back up a bit and look at harmine. Harmine is, again, the major beta carboline, major MAO inhibitor in, uh, in ayahuasca. Very simple molecule, but it's far more uh, than just an MAO inhibitor. It is, for example, an inhibitor of DYRK1A, which I'll say a little bit about in a minute. It also has affinity, not very potently, but it has it for things like the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the target of most true psychedelics, and the 5-HT2C receptor, and something called the imadaz imadazoline receptor, I can hardly say it, and even the dopamine uptake uh, 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 transporter. So, uh, and it has a variety of uh, pharmacological effects here. For example, antidepressant, anxiolytic. Um, can't even read it here, uh, but you can see for yourself it has been uh, suggested that it's hallucinogenic. I don't know if that term really applies. At high doses, it may be. Uh, it has. It affects dopamine release. It has a variety of. Uh, of uh, effects, and it's certainly more than simply uh, MAO inhibition. So harmine, uh, just that simple molecule it itself, is, is uh, deserving of uh, more investigation. Yeah, most of you may know, but why these uh, alkaloids, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine, are, have those names is because they were originally isolated from Peganum harmala and before they had been found in ayahuasca. And, and in natural products chemistry, they often name things after the, the genus or the species that they isolate them from. So that's how these things got to have their names. Uh, okay. Uh, there are other effects of, of harmine. Uh, as I mentioned, it interacts with DNA. It can form photoadducts with DNA. It's genotoxic, it may be, uh, it may be carcinogenic, it may be anti-carcinogenic under some circumstances. It does have uh, anti-tumor activity because of its cytotoxicity against a number of human tumor cell lines. It inhibits various enzymes, not only, uh, not only uh, monoamine oxidase, but this DIRK1 that I was talking about and other enzymes that are associated with cellular metabolism. It has antiviral activity, and it's a very good antiparasitic. I mean, in, in indigenous context, this may be why uh, harmine in, in ayahuasca is taken, because it does protect against, against exposure to uh, parasites. Uh, now, the harmine and DYRK story, uh, DYRK1A story, is quite interesting. Um, let me see. I do have notes here. I actually don't have to look at this. <laughs> um, all right. I, uh, I got all these wet, so now it's, now, it, now it's a problem, you know? Sorry, please bear with me. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Right. Okay. Yeah, so DYRK1A is a is a kinase. It's a it's a cellular element that phosphorylates things and it's involved with uh, a number of regulatory processes on the cellular level as you can see here. Uh including things like nerve cell growth, uh uh, um, cell proliferation, the development and differentiation of, uh, of the nervous system and so on. So, you know, DIYRK1A is an especially important sort of regulator at the center of many processes uh, that are important to brain development. It actually is located on the, uh, part, on the chromosome 21 in a critical area, chromosome 21 is associated with Down syndrome, and DYRK 
uh, is involved with that. And it turns out that inhibition of DYRK1 can uh, reduce the, 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 uh, the uh, abnormalities of, of brain development associated with Down syndrome and also uh, Alzheimer's, the loss of uh, neuronal function associated with, uh, with cognitive deficits. And it turns out that harming by inhibiting uh, this, uh, this kinase may uh, help prevent Alzheimer's as well as help prevent some of the pathologies associated with, uh, with Down syndrome. So it's a pretty significant uh, discovery recently. <laughs> it's, there was uh, a Brazilian group that investigated this in vitro uh, just recently and published on it, and they reported that harming stimulates the proliferation of human neural uh, cell progenitors, essentially what we would call stem cells in vitro. And at a, a 7.5 micromolar concentration, it stimulated growth of new nerve cells by 71%. So that's a very robust response, and that may be one reason why regular drinking of ayahuasca helps maintain cognitive function, and we're all probably familiar with many ayahuascaros and others who are quite advanced in age, but quite, uh, you know, quite cognitively competent. Uh, so there, you know, I mean, that may be a link, a leap, but that's kind of how you can link the evidence. And so there's going to be a lot more work going on with these beta carbolines and, uh, and this kinase. Uh, they also interact with a lot of different receptors in, in uh, receptor binding studies. This is a summary of some work that was done by Glennon's group uh, earlier in, in the 2000s. They looked at a whole structural range of beta carbolines with various receptors, and they measured the affinity for these receptors. I've really simplified it in this table by taking out the... Uh, the by uh, highlighting the compounds that were the most active uh, at these receptors. For example, the fully aromatic ones, uh, for example, Harman, uh, was pretty good at the 5-HT2A receptor, not a very strong affinity. The smaller the numbers in this chart, the higher the affinity, right? So 5-HT2A, Harman, very simple aromatic beta carboline, was active, and the dihydros, in this case, dihydro 5 methoxy was even more active at the 2A receptor and the 2C receptor, and not so much at the 1A, the 5-HT1A receptor, or the dopamine receptor, or the benzodiazepine receptor, which is another target for beta carbolines, it turns out. The tetrahydro uh, harman uh, also had activity at these receptors, and the Three substituted, uh, the uh, three substituted beta carbolines as a family tend to have affinity for the benzodiazepine receptors. For example, beta carboline carboxylate methyl ester is kind of the the classic uh, BZ receptor uh, 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 beta carboline. Very high affinity at that receptor. Three as opposed to many hundreds, and this is the, the KI, for those of you that care about what these numbers mean. Um, so they do interact with benzodiazepine receptors at a variety of activities, and they can cause, uh, some of them are mixed agonists, partial agonists, or antagonists. They can be tremor-inducing, sedative, anxiolytic, as well as anxiogenic, depending on the structure. Some of them are pro-convulsant. Some enhance learning and memory. And so there's a promising area, too, to look at. Uh, this compound, for example, uh, has been found in human studies that it stimulates attention, alertness, and memory. And it works through the benzodiazepine receptors, the so-called BZ receptors. Not so much to do with MAO or, or uh, serotonin. Uh, and imidazoline receptors, I can hardly say it, but it turns out imidazoline is the clonidine binding site, 
and many beta carbolines uh, bind to this receptor. And the imidazoline is, we're just sort of beginning to sort out. It has a variety of functions. It mediates hypertensive effects or anti-hypertensive effects of this class of compounds. It's also uh, an allosteric binding site of monoamine oxidase. So it mediates pain modulation, and it also is neuroprotective. Uh, it regulates insulin secretion from pancreatic cells, so potentially some of these may be anti-diabetic. Uh, and these receptors are emerging as therapeutic targets for inflammatory processes, neural protection, pain, opiate addiction, and various psychiatric disorders. Uh, and the simple beta carbolines, the simplest beta carbolines that we know, like Harman and pinaline from the pineal gland, very close, almost there, uh, uh, appear to be the endogenous ligands for, uh, for uh, the, this class of receptors. Uh, so beta carbolines are structurally diverse, fantastically rich. There's very simple to very complex structures. As you can see here, it's a rich uh, area to explore for the medicinal chemist. And uh, you're going to see a lot more uh, coming out in the literature about beta carbolates. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, come up. Yeah. Considering all my accidents, Bia, I think that's not too bad. <laughs> Hey, Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wondered if you had any words about the research maybe 20 years ago that if I recall, some large doses of harmaline were cytotoxic, uh, excitotoxic to Purkinje cells. And what should we be thinking about that? The, no, harmaline was, I'm having trouble with my hearing aids. They're not working, so repeat. As I recall, maybe about 20 years ago, I think it was Carl Janssen published a paper showing that in rats, harmaline, but not harmine, if I, regret, if I recall correctly, was excitotoxic to Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about that regarding the whole class of beta carbolines. I think it's possible. I'm really not familiar with that work, but I, I do remember something about it. Yeah, that it's quite possible. You know, um, ibogaine, I think, has similar, you know, there's a similar kind of activity with ibogaine, too, you know, a cerebellar toxicity. I don't know what has happened in the field since then. No. Hi. Uh, this might be a little bit off topic, but do you think the, uh, the 5H2A affinity could be responsible for the purported psychedelic effects of species like Amanita muscaria that contain these sort of compounds? They contain, but probably not, actually. I mean, the pharmacology of Amanita muscaria is not you know, there's a lot to soar out, yeah. but they think that the main uh, psychoactive constituents are things like uh, ibotenic acid and muscobol, which are, which are GABA agonists, so they work on a completely different set of receptors. But then there are beta carbolines in it, there are probably tryptamines, it's so chemically complex. I think the consensus is that uh, it's these GABA agonists that are responsible for the activity which is not to say that these other things may not contribute to it. That's another gray area where there needs to be a lot more work because amanitas are so chemically you know, variable. There are many chemical races and being fungi, you know, they're affected by their environment. Whatever they're getting from their mycorrhizal partners can also show up in their chemistry. So another, another area for legions of graduate students to spend the rest of their lives on, and worthy of looking into. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Three-minute break. Thank you.